Well, Ted, it's uh, good to have you back for the finale. Yeah, man, you know, not much of an anime guy. I got Elena out of the house for the weekend. Binge watched Attack on Titan. You know, I figured, give the fans what they want. I always see him on Twitter bragging about how good Attack on Titan was. Big, big Reiner guy, dude. Second part's releasing in the fall, right? Releasing in the fall? No, when, no, when I, no, I texted you and said, come through to review the finale for The Last of Us. Why, why would it be Attack on Titan? Well, the text, I mean, I thought, I could have sworn you said, it wasn't Attack on Titan? Aaron's behind me with a golf club, isn't he? No, 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 no! <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Nerd Soup. I am Bo Oliver, joined here today with Aaron, the Nerd Soup Monkey, and we are back to review The Last of Us, Episode 9, Look for the Light, the season finale of Season 1, directed by Ali Abbasi and written by Craig Mazin and Neil Druckmann. It's all over. Look at that. But I think they're coming back for Season 2 because there was a sequel to the game. Hooray for everybody who didn't know that. Good finale. Uh, I, I was a little disappointed by the runtime when it was revealed, and it did feel like a shot of adrenaline, especially the way that it wrapped up. And I was so happy that they stuck to the source material. And if you're watching this, I imagine you've watched the episode, so we're going to get into spoilers. Figured we'd give this warning because no stone was left unturned in that hospital, unfortunately for the Fireflies and Doctors. So that was just a, a brutal moment where a, a character who has been portrayed in a positive light, for the most part, shows no no remorse because of his dedication to this young girl that he feels has saved his life. But how far are you willing to go to preserve that? And I think for a lot of people, they didn't see this coming. Because when I played the game, I did not see this coming. <laughs> I mean, you can kind of get a sense what he's capable of or how far he's willing to go last episode when that during that interrogation scene when he's just ruthless. And here that carries over. And yeah, like you said, it was just fucking brutal. And I'm glad they didn't shy away from that aspect of Joel because... I mean, when you're playing that part of the game, you really are just running through this hospital, just murdering people. That's exactly how it is. Yeah. yeah, you're hiding behind doors, you're trying to get the drop on people, you're taking everybody out. You've got the machine gun, you've got the handgun, you've got the flamethrower in some instances. And I remember playing the game thinking, they're building this relationship, he's revitalizing his love for life because of Ellie, and uh, he's going to have to give her up because she's the key to the cure, and that's going to be really sad. And no, it's almost as if Joel, both in the game and in the show, takes uh, takes matters into his own hands to break this cliche in the most brutal way possible. I'm not going to let that happen. I'm, I don't want to experience that type of loss again. So I'm going to kill all of these people, and I'm just going to bring her back with me. I'm going to force us to have this happy ending. And that's why it was so traumatizing in the game and also in the show, because it wasn't supposed to go down this way. As I said, he, he decides to give himself this happy ending. He decides to take the choice out of Ellie's hands and bring them back to Tommy's. And it left me feeling empty in the best possible way. And I think the show really did nail that down, at least for me. Well, yeah, it's something that what I appreciated a lot when after the thing with David in the game, the interactions between Ellie and Joel, specifically Joel, the way he talks to her and how open he is with just while you're playing the game and walking through the streets, going into the town and trying to get to the hospital. It's just, you, you see, you could tell a, a switch is flipped. He is able to let his guard down and fully embrace Ellie and just have fun, make jokes. And it's, it's a totally different Joel, but still Joel, you know, if you know what I'm saying. I appreciated the way they did that in this episode too, because you see that little switch flip and he is just a different person towards her. Uh, more fatherly figure and I like how they able to, I like how they were able to adapt that and it makes just what the decision he makes later that much more hurtful and as an audience you believe it way more because of how he just views Ellie at this point yeah and for Ellie you know there's so much coldness towards Joel in this episode and it's because of what she had just experienced that was by far the most traumatizing event of the story so far and even though Joel was there to comfort her in the end it's a moment that she experiences for the most part alone mm -hmm. she was the one who had to kill David so those scars are hers to bear and it is heartbreaking that Joel is finally fully letting his guard down and as you said acting more like a father asking her to read him jokes and showing her the can of chef boy rd but she's just it isn't until they see the giraffes which was such a sweet moment in the game and i think also in the show that she's able to 
take a breath and resolves to continue on with this journey. I hate using this word because I feel like it is overused, but I think the game was a bit more subtle in its execution where Joel does turn the page and you notice it, and it makes it more heartbreaking because it's not explicitly addressed as it is, and I think they keep doing this. They did it in episode 6 where Joel has to look at the camera and tell us exactly how he's feeling, things that we already know. Time didn't save me. It was you, Ellie. Right, yeah, that's true. <laughs> Right, as I said, he was dead inside, but now he's got this new love for life. But I think that the show overall, and it's not a huge criticism, could have just used a, a bit more touch of subtlety and a, a bit more confidence in their audience that we're taking this journey with you. We we got it. Mm -hmm. You don't have to hold my hand. I'm I'm okay. Get hit by a truck. <laughs> no, I enjoyed this finale very much, but like like you said small criticisms here and there. I think it could have been a little longer. I think they could have drawn out some of the suspense in some of these moments because it kind of just felt like everything happened so quickly. And then even the ending in the game, I feel like, I don't want to say it was anticlimactic, but it just takes like, it's a little drawn out and it just, everything just ha like in the game, everything like just happens, this crazy shit just goes down and then you're kind of like, oh, you're in a car with Joel. And then they kind of show the flashbacks. It's edited the same way, which I appreciated. But I think, you know, getting that extra, you know, five minutes of just walking with Ellie and having those little interactions wraps it up nicer. Uh, I'm not saying it wasn't done well here. It just maybe could have used an extra 15 minutes. I, I don't know why on your finale you go for a 45-minute episode and, you know, the first five, six minutes are flashbacks. Right, and I feel like a, a lot of the tension in this episode was found in that opening flashback with Ellie's mom who was played by Ashley Johnson who voiced Ellie in the game. So, when you first hear her in that opening scene, I thought, "Ellie? Mm. Is it, what's going on here? This is the uh this is the other Ellie." But that moment of her just being on the run while also giving birth to Ellie and she has to fight off the infected and she looks down and there's a baby. So right from her very first moments on this world, Ellie was a fighter. So I did enjoy that when she picks her up and says, yeah, you know, you, you tell the world. She, <laughs> Ellie didn't let up. That was the moment where I felt the most tension. And a lot of it came between Anna and Marlene when she's saying, this is what you're going to do. We've known each other for a long time. You're going to take my kid, save her. And I thought that Marlene wasn't going to kill her. I thought, man, you got to take her out of her fucking misery. Don't do that. That's the worst thing someone would have done on this show. But she does go back. And the, the stupid guy didn't even cover Ellie's ears. <laughs> it's like, cover her ears. He's like, huh? Don't tell me what to do. <laughs> That'd be me holding a baby because I just don't want to drop it. I just can't hear anything. You know? Wait, how do you? How do you, you only got so many hands. <laughs> that is true, right? <sighs> but as I said, I thought that uh, opening, you know, the, the visuals of it too, it was really pretty. And I think that house may have been the house that, well, that may come back in part two. So... We will see. Just seeing Ashley Johnson, I thought she gave a, a great performance. She's such a fantastic voice actress, and a lot of the times those voice actors, they translate really well to live action. So it was very meta. Ellie gives birth to Ellie, yeah. but I enjoyed her performance. Yeah, and it was interesting the way they explained that she got bit before she gave birth, and that's what essentially made Ellie immune. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. I think that's a fun explanation. Even though she fucking lied her ass off. <laughs> She's like, no, I snipped it right before the zombie came in, trust nope, me. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> no, she's actually a couple weeks old. <laughs> that is interesting. Is it, good preschools? Dude, that would make sense why it's so rare, because you would have to literally get bit on your due date. Yeah, and who knows how long like how long that window actually is. Maybe there's what a if chance. if she came out infected? That would have been weird. I, I thought of that, and then I thought, I'm so happy that this didn't happen. A little baby zombie? Yeah. Can't even do anything? It's like when uh you know the Targaryens give birth to the dragon babies. Yeah. Disgusting. Yeah. And obviously that connects a little bit later with Marlene and her decision and her investment in the situation. Yeah, I actually thought that was a good way to emotionally tie in Marlene to Joel and Ellie's story. Because in the game, it, she's just trying to find a cure. Yeah. And you can argue, and uh, I imagine many people will be having these debates, was it the right thing or the wrong thing to do? Did Joel go from hero to villain in those moments? Knowing that Marlene was tasked with protecting Ellie, and then her having to be the one to make the decision to kill her so that they can try and manufacture a cure, it adds a new element of heartbreak to it. It's like Dumbledore raising Harry to be slaughtered his entire life. She didn't know that, but... Yeah. This is what circumstances have brought them to. No, it's definitely something where you can argue back and forth, and there really is no right answer. I think Joel did nothing wrong, because I also did it when I played with him. 
<laughs> right. I'm glad it justified yeah. that. Although I also killed the nurses. I, so, I killed yeah. them too, yeah. <laughs> he got a little soft on me there. I didn't even try. I'm like, oh, I guess I got to kill these nurses. <laughs> no, I came in blasting, dude. It was literally the Danny DeVito meme yeah. where I, I was so shaken up by what I just experienced that everyone could get it. Everyone was catching bullets. <laughs> yeah, at that point. <laughs> yeah. Well, Joel's a better man than I. <laughs> it was uh, a free-for-all, man. Um, When he told them turn around, I was like, oh, shit. Yeah, that didn't execute. Yeah, oh my god. That's dark, Joel. I shot him right in the face. <laughs> I, at least I had the respect to do it while they were looking. <laughs> um, and one doctor picking up the scalpel. What are you doing, buddy? This is Joel Miller, man. He didn't even... That's the thing that was so horrifying about the way he was going about it, is there was no second-guessing anything. Mm. He As soon as he saw somebody, he pulled a trigger. There was no contemplation, no remorse whatsoever. That's why it was so horrifying. And I've been sort of uh, frustrated with the way they've portrayed Joel. I feel like they've scaled back some of the nastiness of his personality. But now I wonder if maybe this was the better way to do it, where he's finally opening up emotionally. He's showing his softer side. He's dealing with these issues. And then he just fucking snaps at the end. This is the Joel Miller who's earned this sort of reputation. But just the the music, you know, normally in a moment like this, I like to let the elements speak for itself. You know, the sounds of shells hitting the floor and screams and blood. But the score really just swelled up the moment. Yeah. Where it, it was so, you couldn't escape it. This was, uh, he was like a slasher villain, a monster stalking his prey. It was horrifying. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And there were, it was like the first moment of like, like seeing Joel. Cause like in a, when you play a video game, you're literally, Joel k- killed like a thousand people on that journey. <laughs> Um, That's what's fun about Uncharted is that you kill like 300 people. <laughs> yeah. Just all cannon fodder. <gasps> And just snapping jokes. So, like, you view him as, like, an untouchable superhero, like anyone. Joel can't lose to anybody. And here you get to see, like, yeah, he's just the baddest motherfucker <laughs> right now roaming these streets. Like, anyone can get it, like you said. But, yeah, like, just the decision he made, obviously, in that moment, and just seeing how much Ellie means to him. And I think most parents would... It's a tougher decision from us, like, outside looking in. Maybe we can say yes or we could say no, but I think that's just a special bond that some people really just don't understand so at the end of the day of all the loss that he's had to endure all the people around him that he's failed in his mind to do to have that happen again is not going to be something that he's just going to let transpire he makes the decision for ellie but also the fireflies made a decision for ellie as well she loses you know all agency in this moment and she doesn't have the ability to choose sure you can argue that she would have made that decision herself to sacrifice herself for the greater good of humanity but at the end of the day she's not given that choice right yeah that is a good point because the fireflies are assuming that she would have been all right with it and i remember at the time the argument was the world is broken beyond repair It's done nothing good for Joel. Why should Joel do anything good for the world? Why should he save this world when it's only given him heartbreak, torment, and trauma? So, as you said, we can argue that for years because it's already been argued for years. But I I just think it's fun, and it was a bold decision at the time, and they didn't shy away from it in their execution here. And uh, once again, I'm just really excited to get people's reactions to it and to see those debates play out again. But for Ellie, yeah, Bella Ramsey has probably been my favorite part of the show so far. And in those final moments that she's sharing with Joel, it is heartbreaking because she's expressing that survivor's guilt. She's talking about all the people that she's lost. And the iciness towards Joel is just so unfortunate. As soon as he's starting to embrace her, now she's dealing with this. She she can't reciprocate in a way that would make our hearts warm. Because of, it's like she knows something is off, even when he's telling her what happened. She wants to trust him because he's been the person that's that's been there for her. Uh, throughout these throughout this journey that's been so tough on both of them and she's fought like hell as Joel said so they've built that trust it's almost as if she refuses to believe that Joel would break it so when she asks him at the end you know swear to me and then she gives him the okay I believe you you could tell that there's still something there that there's something off with their relationship yeah he's not a good liar no a guy like that never would be right I could have made up a better story than that (laughs) yeah he's like no no, there's more of you they couldn't do anything and then the raiders came and people died. Yeah, you know, typically when you got test, you out of here though. <laughs> that was uh, you should have seen me. It was incredible. Yeah. You on my back at the shotgun. I didn't kill anybody though. I did yeah. it real clean, Batman style. You know, and typical. You know, when you test somebody, you knock them out with medication. <laughs> that's usually how tests go. Yeah, that's 
no, he's not good at that. <laughs> but yeah, him opening up about like him trying to commit suicide after what happened with Sarah and things like that, really opening, even being able to talk about Sarah. That 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 would be something a couple episodes ago that would set him off. Now he's he trusts Ellie and is comfortable with her enough to discuss Sarah. So yeah, just the leaps he, they've made in that relationship up, up until this point. And yeah, like you said, Ellie at this point has been through so much. And I don't know if it was more of being scared of what's going to happen next, if this is the end of their road or, you know, just the unknown going forward with this and maybe potentially losing Joel or it not being the same after this event. But you see how that's all affected her in these moments. Right, yeah, that's why I think I thought it was so smart, the way they were setting it up, that, yeah, these two characters aren't going to get a happy ending. And I've made this point that Joel says, no, we are, I'm going to force this. But I do think maybe... When Joel says to Ellie, why don't we just go back to Tommy's? Why don't we just wrap this up, call it a day? And she goes, no, everything that we've been through, everything we fought for, we have to see this through. And I thought in my own head, you guys have been through some stuff, but you could have went through some more stuff. I think there could have been a bit more fight to this season. And I think that's why a lot of people are complaining that the season as a whole does feel rushed. Some people, man, I I see it all the time. People who haven't played the games and they're getting like episode five, episode six. Where are the zombies? Or when the zombies show up, they're like, oh yeah, this is a zombie show. And I'm not trying to be this meathead of it needs to be an action show all the time, but that helps build your world. It makes you... You realize what what the situation is. What's so terrifying? Why someone like Marlene would break a promise to her best friend and kill her daughter for the cure? Exactly. Yeah. It reinforces, uh, it reemphasizes the dire situation that they're all in that the world is broken and a lot of people believe it's beyond repair but marlene's holding out hope but it does feel sometimes that the threat has been lost in a lot of the character development and the emotional development which people would argue that's a good thing but i think it just you made the point a few weeks ago we need to know why they're fighting so desperately and i think that has been a little lost and we got the infected in the opening flashback but for the season as a whole i i was disappointed with the lack of zombies and specifically the lack of clickers because i think if you ask a lot of people hey those clickers are scary. They're going to be like, what? What's a clicker? What do they do? It's like, oh, remember the zombies back in episode two? Mm. It's like, oh, episode two. That was a long ass time ago. <laughs> and that was a long episode. <laughs> so it does feel a little weird. Uh, I joke that HBO was trying to uh, speed run it. I don't know if they're trying to impress their girlfriend or something. Your girlfriend gets impressed when you give her a speed run? Well, that's the thing. <laughs> she doesn't. <laughs> but you believe that she's impressed. It's as if you're taking her to one of your sporting games, you know? Yeah. Got my girl in the stands. Yeah, I'm killing all these doctors, babe. Because when this episode ended, I thought, man, it's over. That was really short. 43 minutes? Yeah, it It's was. weird for a finale. Right, and there's definitely more you could have went into. Like you said, I mean, in the game, there's an extended sequence. You fight some bloaters and everything like that. And But I think the, the main thing you really had to capture was just that break in Joel. And I think they did that well. Yeah, it's so hard unless you know what's going on behind the scenes of how they're going to use their budget and their different resources. I think that a lot of shows, they get swept up in wanting to make things cinematic. So it's like when Game of Thrones did the zombie bear. We're going to blow all our budget on that. Well, maybe spread that out and give us more one-on-one or two-on-two encounters with the White Walkers. Sometimes that's more epic than an army of White Walkers or an army of infected in this case. So instead of giving us that swarm of zombies, the swarm of infected in episode five, and I did love episode five, with all these different characters and all this commotion and all this chaos, sometimes it's more effective to just put one character or two characters in a moment like that. Mm. And I think that it's not even the gameplay, but the cutscenes when you look at the game were at times were just so much more cinematic short bursts of of action not these big moments but just the way they were framed and the way they were angled when Joel and Ellie get knocked out in this finale by the tear gas that was goofy as fuck you just see them walking behind them and they lightly they just lob <laughs> little underhand Pat Mahomes lob right in between them and they get knocked out I'm like that's stupid <laughs> it's like so tapping somebody on the shoulder and they look the other way <laughs> <laughs> a little nitpick and people are going to say I'm spoiling the fun but uh, overall I thought it was a really strong episode and I'm happy they didn't peel back from the violence they had an opportunity to scale it back a bit but they said no this is the direction we're going you're going to have to deal with it <laughs> your sweet baby boy Joel Miller is a murderer yeah, I mean, he wakes up, the first thing he asks about is Ellie. 
And Marlene's like, why do you care? Right. That is an interesting point. Yeah. She didn't anticipate that this hardened, cold bastard would grow a heart. I kept thinking Ellie, like, she just, she wasn't frustrated. The reason why she was upset is because she liked Joel before. And he's getting, he's getting too emotional for her liking. <laughs> She's like, you're annoying now. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, God, I'll read you some fucking puns. <laughs> Just leave me alone. She became the parent in this uh, relationship. Yeah. Liked you better when you were depressed. Yeah. You were funnier. <laughs> yeah, because he's just trying too hard now, right? He's like, oh, Chef Boyardee. You like Chef Boyardee, right? Read me some jokes. Entertain me. All right, guys, before we finish this episode, I want to give a quick shout out to today's sponsor, Smile Brilliant. Hey, look, I'm a floating head. Bad breath can be an annoying problem to deal with, especially when in social settings like out on a date or recording a podcast with your buddies. Only 2% of the population has enough naturally occurring good bacteria to fight off bad breath and maintain a healthy mouth. What people don't realize is that when brushing your teeth or using mouthwash, you're killing both the good and bad bacteria in your mouth. Unfortunately, bad bacteria grows back much faster than good bacteria. So even if you use these products consistently, you may still find yourself with bad breath. But we have a solution. Smile Brilliant's Dental Probiotics, chewable tablets with concentrated amounts of the healthy bacteria your mouth needs, so that you can speak freely without worrying about any dirty looks from your friends or coworkers. Chewed once a day before bed and after brushing your teeth, these tablets populate your mouth with the good bacteria first, before the bad stuff has a chance to grow back. By repeating this process on a daily basis, studies have shown that you can truly increase the population of good bacteria, while subsequently reducing the population of bad bacteria. Studies have also shown that clinical-grade dental probiotics reduce plaque, cavities, gum inflammation, and of course bad breath. So head on over to smilebrilliant.com and check out their dental probiotics. You can also browse their selection of other products like mouth guards, electric toothbrushes, whitening gel, whitening trays, water flosser, and more. Plus, you will receive 20% off your order when you use promo code NERDSOUP at checkout. So, don't wait. Head on over to their website, choose the products that are right for you, and take care of your teeth. I think even after he gets Ellie back, that moment in the garage talking to Marlene, that one last chance to, you know, appeal to him and do the right thing, (laughs) just fucking shoots her again. I'm not, this is not working on me. I'm going to shoot you now. And I'm going to shoot you execution style. I thought that was fucking brutal. When he's just like, you'll just come after her and shoots her right in the head again. That was, that's pretty brutal. Especially to someone that he had an actual connection with. Right, yeah, it just goes to show that he has fully snapped in this moment. I don't know if you could say that he's snapped, but he's not going to give her up uh, under any circumstances. So there's nothing that Marlene could have said to him in this moment, aside from, you were right, take her, have fun at Tommy's, and uh, I won't come looking for you. And even then, Joel would probably be like, yeah, you probably will, so I'm going to fucking shoot you. (laughs) Poor Marlene, right? Everything that she's fought for. She could have lied also. She was like, yeah, the cordyceps are in her brain, so yeah, it's not going to end well. She could have been like, oh, it's surgery, yeah, two hours, she'll be fine. (laughs) Here, we'll let you sit in the waiting room, watch some TV. (laughs) <laughs> we'll come get you when it's all over. Oh my God, Joel, it just went terribly wrong. Yeah. We, uh, part of her brain fell out. Sorry. Got a cure, though. <laughs> and then Joel refuses to take the cure. <laughs> that one could probably stay in. It's vague enough. Mm. Yeah, when you think about it that way, it is uh, Joel not killing a friend, but at the very least an associate. All As right. you said, somebody he does have a pass with. So at this point, he's got tunnel vision. It's all about him and Ellie. And he is so desperate to get back to Tommy's and to have that normal life where they can have fun, they can joke with each other, they can watch movies. Play guitar. Right, play guitar. Paradise is right over the hill. He can't take his eyes off of it. So for Ellie, as you said, the choice is taken from her. But you get the feeling that this is something that she would have chosen for herself. And we never would have known. It's interesting. That's why I've been so impressed with Bella Ramsey throughout the first season and the performance here is a bit more subtle you're getting everything from her demeanor and how cold she is towards joel and especially the final moments that they do share when she's asking him to tell her the truth and her face swells up and she doesn't know what to believe but she's going to put her trust in joel because Mm -hmm. what other choice does she have in this moment so that's why i said it just feels like something is off between them and something is broken inside of her and that came out through her performance 100% you know whatever at whatever point in the story wherever ellie needed to be emotionally bella ramsey was up for the challenge yeah i mean both of them have just been fantastic all season they really do 
embody those two characters straight from the games and kind of or also to make them their own in their own regard and at the end of the day the story is about Joel and Ellie and those are the two most important things you need to do right and they did that so right yeah and I think that they benefited from the casting getting those two actors but what hurts the relationship is the story does feel rushed and I think I've seen people say that where you know moments in their relationship could have been further developed and fleshed out to make it feel a a bit more natural I think because the actors have such great chemistry that they've been able to get away with it for the most part but it definitely could have helped it does feel a bit when you compare it to the game and I'm just going to keep doing this it, it feels a bit more labored in the way the story is told whereas in the game it just go it's smooth sailing from start to finish which is strange because once again we don't know behind the scenes and the budget and the numbers but It seems like there was a a smoother way to plan this out. If you're going to spend so much time on adding things to the story, maybe you need to go 10, 11, 12 episodes. And shows seem to be really afraid of going beyond 10 these days because all the prestige shows, it's 10 and under. I don't know, maybe season two. They've talked about, because there is a sequel, splitting the second game into multiple seasons. I think that would greatly benefit the show. Yeah, the second game has a lot more going for it. It is a bit longer, so I think you can easily do that. Yeah, and a lot of people pointed out the parallels between Joel holding Sarah in episode right, one, yeah. and now Joel holding Ellie, so... And Joel shot first this time. Yeah, he did. I think it does speak to... He talked about it in prior episodes when he's talking with Tommy in episode six, that he's been unable to save Ellie. It's always Ellie saving his ass. So it, it's his opportunity to save her in this horrifying and brutal way. <laughs> it's funny to think in his own mind he's like man you're the hero look at all these bad guys you're taking out we're gonna she, save Ellie she wakes up during everything and like the hospital's on fire people are screaming he's like what's going on I'm saving you baby <laughs> baby girl hold on just <laughs> daddy's here we're going home <laughs> It's literally Spongebob and Patrick, we saved the city. (laughs) We saved Ellie. But it's tragic because it's finally his moment. And I think that the show has always played with this idea of we see it in shows that you're destined to do something, right? Ellie is the so-called chosen one in this world. But it doesn't work out that way because if she dies, a part of Joel is going to die and he can't live with that. So as I said, he's been struggling with his injuries and with his PTSD. He's not the man he once was. So in order to get back to that place, he has to experience something like this. It's always the word, you know, it's finally Joel and Ellie embrace each other in episode eight. And it's after Ellie had to kill a pedophile. It can never come easy for these characters. So we're getting what we wanted. We're we're seeing Joel in his prime, but he's doing horrible things. But he is saving the, his daughter. And even then, he still have to go to war with these things. <laughs> no, yeah, the ones who are infected are just yeah, they're still there chilling. Although maybe they're not because we haven't seen them in quite some time. <laughs> That's why it was funny. She's like, I-, I lost all these men trying to get here. How the hell did you two do it? And they're like, oh, we just didn't see anything. <laughs> Better at the game than you. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry that you suck. We played on easy mode. Yeah, so for for Joel to have all that guilt of who he couldn't save come to head in that moment, it goes to show that the guilt that he was feeling, we know this, it wasn't on him because of this world and because of everything that they're dealing with. People die. That stuff happens. But the fact that he puts all the blame on himself, it rears its head in such a, an ugly way here in the end. Well, yeah, he needs to take his own advice because when Ellie brings up Riley, Tess, and Sam, and Joel's like, no, that's not on you. I mean, you got to take your own advice. Right. Oh, yeah. well, that's not what's happened in your life wasn't on you either. Yeah, and I think that's what's so tragic about their relationship because we want them to be friendly with each other and embrace each other, but in many ways they mirror each other, especially their experiences. So for Joel still not being able to accept that those deaths aren't on him, and now to be lying to Ellie, something that he's never done, it sets a bad example for Ellie. Because she's a smart kid. She's going to be able to pick up on things. And I think you even see it there in these moments, especially when she turns around in the car. That was a moment that hit me in the game, too, that this kid is broken. Even though she's being told something that's supposed to make her feel better, she just can't bring herself to be happy in these moments. So the the parallels of these two characters are a bit frightening, I think, from the outside looking in. So what do we do for Sundays from now on? No football, no Last of Us? Isn't Succession coming back? Yeah, two weeks. We gotta kill one. We gotta kill kill a weekend. Better question is, what is everybody else gonna do? Because nobody watches Succession. <laughs> Those motherfuckers are gonna be out of commission until House of the Dragon. <laughs> golf. They do golf on Sundays. Oh. Oh, you want to like actually go play golf? That's funny because you just hit Teddy. You got the you got to clean off your golf club. 
<laughs> fucking psychopath. <laughs> but yeah, season one of The Last of Us, I enjoyed reviewing it. And I think that for all my criticisms, I can still say confidently it's one of the best video game adaptations of all time. And the bar has been set so incredibly low. But at the very least, this is a good show. It's a good HBO production. And uh, we're going to get Teddy back here and we'll talk about the finale further in detail and really the season as a whole. So I'm also looking forward to that because there is a lot to talk about and uh, I'm excited to jump into the discussion on the internet as long as it stays civil and respectful. I think for the most part people are going to have fun debates about Joel's decision here at the end. But uh, a a solid finale. Even though it was a little short, I would have liked to have spent a a bit more time, especially with a finale, you know, you kind of just want to get that hour, hour, ten minutes. Those always feel, it feels different. Yeah, It's like watching the Super Bowl compared to a regular season game, but it was good. It definitely packed a punch. Yeah, I agree. I think in terms of adaptations, like you said, not even just adaptations, it's a good show on its own, but attention to detail, the care they took, little things from the game, you know, really not messing with this overall story too much, knowing you have a good thing and sticking with it. Overall, I really enjoyed this show, and I think many people have too. All right, guys, that does it for our review of The Last of Us Finale, Episode 9. Thank you so much for all of you who have watched and commented and engaged with our videos throughout the season. And we hope you'll continue to join us down the road when we review other stuff. We've got a whole slate of videos and shows coming up that we're getting ready to review. And, uh, yeah, for Aaron, the Nerdsu Monkey, and Teddy, I am Bo Oliver, signing off. When you get an email from our lawyer, don't be surprised. Wow, that was probably our best review yet. Hey guys, Aaron the Nerd Soup Monkey here with a brief shameless plug before we end the video. Do you ever feel like you don't have an adequate amount of nerd soup in your life? Like you're going to bed hungry and yearning for the nonsensical yet entertaining nutrients our podcasts provide? Well, we've come up with the perfect solution. The Nerd Soup Fan Question Podcast, exclusively available to our Patreon supporters. You can sign up now by visiting patreon.com slash nerdsoup, and for the price of only $1 per month, you'll receive exclusive access to our weekly podcast, where we answer your questions that don't make it to the main show. And while you're there, you can check out the other rewards we offer to our patrons, like stay stickers, mugs, t-shirts, behind-the-scenes footage, and appearing in the credits at the end of our videos. And that's exactly what we're gonna do right now. Roll the names of the nerds who make Nerd Soup possible. The reason why the crypto crash didn't send our lives spiraling down a black hole of no return. Alright, I'll stop talking so you can listen to this jazzy-ass music while checking if Bo spelt your name wrong in the credits.